Hello and welcome to the Business Standards Morning Show. I'm Kanishka Gupta and let's have a look at the stories for the day. उत्तराखंड गोवा एंड मणिपुर वेंट टू दीजेपी आप क्लिंच पंजाब फ्रॉम कांग्रेस But once the drums fall silent and dust is settled, those taking oath will be staring at a tough road ahead. Both UP and Punjab, the largest states of the lot, have their own set of economic challenges to be dealt with. Our next report offers a peek into it. picture was clear from the beginning on Thursday morning when the early trends from postal ballots started trickling in celebrations erupted in the camps of Bharatiya Janata Party which later clinched four of the five states which went to polls the two big states Uttar Pradesh and Punjab went to BJP and Aam Aadmi Party respectively while it was Aam Aadmi Party's first victory in any state outside of the union territory of Delhi BJP won UP for the second time running with this the BJP has become the first party to win two consecutive UP assembly elections since 1985 the elections in Manipur and Uttarakhand went in favor of the BJP which also emerged as the single largest party in Goa with the three independent winners declaring their support for BJP in the coastal state the party is confident of forming the government but apart from victory the two most populous states of UP and Punjab are also offering a set of challenges to ruling parties the freebies announced by both the parties in their bid to come to power will also add to the financial burden like aam aadmi party had announced to give 1000 rupees to every woman aged above 18 years in punjab after coming to power and now that it has come to power this promise alone is expected to cost the state exchequer over 1000 crore a month besides this the party has promised a 24 hour water supply and 20000 liters of water free of cost to every household each month along with an assurance that no new taxes would be introduced Party convener Arvind Kejriwal had also promised free electricity up to 300 units a month for domestic customers. The state is already reeling under a high debt of about 2.8 trillion rupees. For this fiscal, it owes about 8000 crore rupees in pending power subsidy dues to Punjab State Power Corporation. The annual dues to the state discom have swelled to more than 20000 crore rupees. Chief Minister Charanjit Singh Channi had recently waived off electricity bills and water dues amounting to thousands of crores Punjab has India's highest debt to gross state domestic product ratio which stood at 53.3% in FY22 the situation is so dire that its annual debt servicing liability is higher than its annual gross borrowings the state also fares poorly when it comes to own tax revenues as a percentage of total revenue receipts just 39% of its total revenue came from own tax revenues It gets more money from the center. About 52% of its revenue comes from central transfers. Meanwhile, UP is a tad better than Punjab. Yogi Adityanath, who is set to take over the reins of UP for the second time, will have to factor in the state's debt, which is expected to be one third of the state's GDP by this financial year end, if he continues welfare schemes and meets BJP manifesto promises of free power supply for irrigation to farmers. UP distributed free ration. between December 2021 and February 2022 as part of the covid relief package just ahead of the state polls political observers have attributed this as being one of the factors that turned the voters towards the ruling dispensation the free distribution done to almost 146 million beneficiaries is expected to cost the exchequer around rupees 300 crore per month officials have said besides free rations welfare schemes like pm awas yojana which provided monetary assistance to build homes Swachh Bharat Abhiyan to build toilets and cash transfers to farmers under the PM Kisan scheme also helped BJP come back to power. However, Uttar Pradesh had the highest percentage of population who were multidimensionally poor after Bihar and Jharkhand, according to a recent Niti Aayog report. 
nearly 38% of the state was suffering from multidimensional poverty. The menace of stray cattle has also emerged as one of the biggest issues of the state's farm economy, causing heavy losses to the incomes of farmers. According to the 2019 livestock census, there were 11.8 lakh stray cattle in UP, an increase of 1.75 lakh since the previous census in 2012. This has forced farmers to hold vigil all night to prevent stray cattle from damaging their fields and incur additional costs to install wiring or fencing. Uttar Pradesh has one of India's lowest labour participation rates, indicating that many are not even looking for jobs. According to private think tank CMIE, UP's labour force participation rate is around 36%, lower than India's 40%. Even the unemployment rate among youths in UP is higher than the national average. The periodic labour force survey says that the unemployment rate in the age group 15 to 29 stood at 23.2% in urban areas of UP during FI21's January to March quarter. This was more than double the overall unemployment figure of 10.6% for urban areas during the same quarter. सब अच्छी दिख रही हैं यार कौन सी खरीदू ये तो वही बात हुई चार हजार शेयर लिस्टेड है कौन सा लू वो तो सबसे आसान है तुझे फाइव पैसा नहीं पता अब तो सबको पता है फाइव पैसा पर है चार हजार स्टॉक्स की रिसर्च टेक्निकल टूल्स और इन्वेस्टमेंट आइडियाज डाउनलोड फाइव पैसा नाउ अब तो सबको पता है इन्वेस्टिंग मेड इजी एंड रिपोर्टिंग विद फाइव पैसा इन्वेस्टमेंट इन सिक्योरिटीज मार्केट आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट केयरफुल बिफोर इन्वेस्टिंग After the economic challenges of UP and Punjab, let us now see what experts think about the entire country's growth amid ongoing global uncertainty. In an interview with Business Standards Arup Roy Chaudhary, Chief Economist at Crystal D K Joshi reiterated his company's stand that India's real GDP will grow at 7.8% in FY23. Joshi believes that crude oil prices will stay between 85. and $90 per barrel during FY22-23 which he says will lead to 5.4% inflation let us listen in sir uh, welcome to this uh, interaction with business standard nice to be here i would like to obviously start by asking about your uh, projection your gdp growth projection for FY23 Now your projection is seven point eight percent GDP, real GDP growth, which is slightly lower than what the government predicted through the economic survey, which is eight to eight point five, and at par with what the RBI has projected, which is also seven point eight. What is the rationale behind this growth projection of yours? Yeah, so we made this projection sometimes in December uh, mm -hmm. and have retained it for two reasons. One, I think, uh, is that. the uh, the omicron wave proved to be mild and i think there is some sense that we are now entering into an endemic stage clearly the risks from covid are now receding so that creates an upside to the number that we had forecast at that time but at the same time i think we have also seen suddenly new risks crop up i mean the geopolitical uh, tensions have mounted Uh, to a very high level i mean i would say and i think that's resulting in a uh, lot of commodity and crude prices etc uh, going up phenomenally uh, so uh, that creates a downside to growth so the call that we took was that the we were likely to up, upwardly revise the 7.8% so we have now kept it at uh, uh, kept it same so there are two opposing forces one positivity that comes particularly to the contact based services which would have suddenly zoomed and which are going to zoom i believe i think in 22 23 but that gets offset by the the uh, the the uh, the ukraine uh, russia conflict that is going on uh, we have assumed that crude will be in the range of 85 to 90 in the year 22 23 it will first uh, quarter maybe it will hover around 100 Uh, after that i think it will start uh, start coming down and to give you an average of around 87 88 i think that's that's the number we are working with right now uh, now the rbi's projection for cpi inflation for retail inflation for the next fiscal is 4.5% and that again was before the recent geopolitical flare up so do you think that projection holds 
uh, anymore do you think that projection holds to anymore and what is your projection given the current situation what do you think would be a realistic assumption for inflation yeah so first of all the central bank's uh, 4.5% uh, inflation cpi inflation forecast so that was made before this flare up so after that i think the situation on oil situation on commodities have actually uh, changed dramatically and that will have to factor uh, that will have to get into rbi's recalculation of inflation now what we have done is we have raised our inflation outlook uh, to 5.4% for this uh, uh, fiscal year which is almost 100 basis point for the coming fiscal year 22 23 which is almost 100 basis point higher than what uh, the central bank uh, projections are food grains i think food grains we are in a comfortable situation the problem is it with edible oils i mean which we import and i think the prices of edible oils have flared so that is going to put some pressure uh, on inflation. The second, I think, part is, of course, fuel. I mean, that will depend on how the burden of global crude price increase is shared between uh, the households, the government, and the oil marketing companies. Uh, so uh, it will definitely be inflationary, more inflationary than uh, 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 what I think the central bank had assumed uh, uh, before, the, before, before the Ukraine crisis started. Uh, to what extent do you think the current commodity prices and the situation will impact government's budget targets, be it revenue and be it other aspects. Um, how do you think that could be impacted? Could that be impacted? But when the budget was announced, I think uh, it was the their assumption on nominal GDP growth was, uh, was conservative. The tax collections uh, uh, were also conservative, conservatively estimated. Now with inflation going up, I think the nominal GDP is certainly going to be higher than what they had uh, they had assumed. I think just because in, because WPI is also going up because input costs are rising and CPI is going to go up from where we where it was expected to be. I mean uh, at that time, so nominal GDP doing well is somewhat good for tax collections. I mean uh, so so I would say that I think the the uh, the the you may still end up with what uh, what the budget has estimated as tax collection for 22 23. But now I think with uh, with what is happening currently, your subsidy bill, which you wanted to shrink, uh, I think by almost 26% in the budget, I think that is under danger. So the reshuffling of expenditure that government was planning to support CapEx, I think that will get challenged. So you have two options, either to cut the CapEx or I think, uh, 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 or to raise the fiscal deficit, I mean, uh, uh, from uh, from its current level. So I think they would probably just try not to raise the fiscal deficit. So the expenditure will get again reshuffled. The rupee situation, how will that, the rupee situation currently, how will that impact our trade, import, export? Well, I think rupee, I we don't expect too much of depreciation in the rupee. This year, this uh, year might close with some uh, March uh, around 76.5 or so. I think that's the average. Next year, I think it uh, we are forecasting it to go down, uh, uh, to fall further to 77.5. Now, this, I think this is a mild depreciation. Between these two ends, I mean, uh, 76.5, there'll be a huge amount of volatility and rupee, rupee could test newer lows. I mean, that is that is very likely. I think the issue is, whether currency remains weak, uh, weakens much more and stays there for longer period of time. I think that is that then that will add to the imported in inflation comp component. I mean, uh, because your inputs will become uh, more expensive. I just wanted to add a little bit to the government's capex also. See, you you uh, you have budgeted X amount of money for capex. Now with your input costs rising. You can you will be able to create less infrastructure than uh, with the same amount of money because your steel, your cement, everything has gone up. I mean prices, so there'll be cost overruns. That's uh, that's another risk for infrastructure projects. I think right now. So do you think capex could be hit and the government would have to spend more on you know as you said the government will have to spend more on subsidies and other welfare measures? I think this is a fluid and evolving situation. So depending on how how uh, how how long this pressure lasts. I think uh, if, if this pressure continues, of course, I think it is it is bound to happen. I mean, uh, and uh, the the uh, the the cushion that the budget had because of uh, conservative estimates, I think that cushion has disappeared now. I think with the, with the new scenario um, emerging. Uh, thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you very much for having this. Yaar, mat pooch yaar. फिर से स्टॉक्स में फंस गया तो स्टॉक्स के साथ बॉन्ड्स इंश्योरेंस गोल्ड में बैलेंस कर इसमें बहुत तामचाम है तुझे फाइव पैसा नहीं पता अब तो सबको पता है फाइव पैसा है ऑल इन वन अकाउंट
डाउनलोड पाए पैसा ना हो अब तो सबको पता है Investing made easy and rewarding with five paisa. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing. Markets have given a thumbs up to BJP's victory in four of the five states. BSE index jumped 817 points, while broader NSE Nifty settled 250 points higher yesterday. Analysts say that the victory will support the markets in the medium to long run, but investors must not take their eyes off global headwinds. Watch our next report to know more. The election euphoria swept the markets yesterday as Bharatiya Janata Party clinched victory in three of the five states and just fell one short of majority in Goa. The S&P BSC Sensex printed 1,595 points intraday while the Nifty climbed 400 points. The BJP strode ahead of the Samajwadi Party in Uttar Pradesh while the Aam Aadmi Party cornered a landslide win in Punjab. The BJP also reigned in Uttarakhand. Manipur and Goa the other three states for which elections were held last month though the election results were for assembly polls this assumes significance as these are seen as a pointer to general elections which are 2 years away according to amnish agarwal state polls are touted as semi final before 2024 general elections have some impact on the direction of economic reforms and visibility of modi led government beyond 2024 given that it included up and a state from the northeast makes it very important the mandate analysts say is a good omen for investors from a medium term perspective as majority states have shown their overwhelming acceptance to work done by the ruling party another interesting subtrend is the emergence of a new creditable alternative to the existing parties on the national stage with pro populist policies around management efficiency Both philosophies analysts say will lead to focus on efficient governance which is a good long term indicator for investments in India. We have Ambrish Balega with us to elaborate on what BJP's win means for investors. The exit polls had shown that uh, BJP is in an advantageous position except Punjab with a close fight in uh, Goa and Uttarakhand. The actual results uh, declared uh, it shows that there's a clear improvement on that thus proving that uh, BJP hasn't lost steam. Investors uh, normally look for a continuity of the incumbent government which has delivered the results and would be in a position to speed up the reforms so these results actually add to the confidence of that thought process going ahead i mean i feel that uh, this bounce uh, maybe may not really be a start of a fresh up move uh, this is more of a sentimental bounce back uh, based on the news flows The global economy could continue to face pressure due to sanctions against Russia. Devarsh Vakil of HDFC Securities meanwhile says the election euphoria may not last long as potential macro shocks weigh on sentiment. BJP is retaining power in Uttar Pradesh. Based on this mandate, the central government will be bold to carry out its agenda confidently and look for opportunities to pursue economic reforms. We expect markets to trade cautiously post the initial euphoria. as this election results come in the economic backdrop that is not conducive for a sustained bull run fears of inflation post high energy cost and normalizing monetary policy will keep in check the stock prices around the globe including in india the market's fag and trade yesterday confirmed vakil's fears the benchmark indices failed to hold on to their gains as global queues remained fluid the bse sensex slipped nearly 800 points from the day's high to end at 55464 The Nifty 52 cooled off around 160 points from the intraday high to end at 16,595. Given the global headwinds including simmering Russia-Ukraine tensions and swinging commodity prices, analysts suggest investors exercise caution. Ashwarya Dadich of Ambit Asset Management says investors need to be vigilant because the uncertainty of geopolitical standoff still looms large. Commodity prices are least likely to see a secular downturn even after war subsides because sanctions will continue to disrupt the global supply chain. Unless sanctions are withdrawn, the global markets can remain volatile in the coming months and India will not remain insulated. On Friday, global queues including commodity prices, Ukraine war, European Central Bank's interest rate decision and inflation and jobs data for the US will continue to sway indices. Are you mad? Hmm. Tum itna dar gaye? Ab 
क्या किया शेयर्स में ट्रेडिंग तुम्हें फाइव पैसा नहीं पता ओए, अब तो सबको पता है फाइव पैसा पर मिलते हैं रिसर्च टूल्स पोर्टफोलियो एनालिटिक्स और इन्वेस्टमेंट आइडिया भी डाउनलोड फाइव पैसा ना अब तो सबको पता है इन्वेस्टिंग मेड इजी एंड रिपोर्टिंग विद फाइव पैसा इन्वेस्टमेंट इन सिक्योरिटीज मार्केट आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल द रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुल बिफोर इन्वेस्टिंग Rolling out an 11-page form, the government had in February this year asked Corporate India to furnish a comprehensive report on their corporate social responsibility or CSR activities. Profit-making entities are expected to give back to the society. From being a voluntary exercise, it has been made mandatory by the government. Our next report tells more about it. Indian companies have spent over 1 trillion rupees on their corporate social responsibility since the framework for corporate spending on community came into force in 2014-15 a senior official in the Ministry of Corporate Affairs told the National Daily this week Corporate social responsibility or CSR refers to a self-regulating business model that companies can utilize to be socially accountable by practicing corporate social responsibility a company can be conscious of the impact it has on economic environmental and social factors csr is a broad concept it can take many forms depending on the nature of the company and industry apart from impacting society csr activities can also help build a stronger bond between corporations and employees it can help both employers and employees feel more connected In order to be socially responsible, first and foremost, the company needs to be accountable to both itself and its shareholders. In normal practice, companies adopt CSR programs once they have grown their business to the point where they can give something back to society. Hence, CSR programs are usually implemented by large corporations. But why do companies engage in CSR activities? This is because the company believes that customers are more likely to do business with a brand that they perceive is ethical. Some companies are also motivated by their personal convictions. It is legally binding too. Under the Companies Act 2013, a certain class of profitable entities must spend at least 2% of their 3-year annual average net profit towards CSR activities in a particular financial year. Companies having a net worth of at least 500 crore rupees or a minimum turnover of 1000 crore rupees or a net profit of 5 crore rupees or more during the immediately preceding financial year have to spend on CSR activities. There are various types of corporate social initiatives. There is corporate philanthropy where a company makes donations to charity via a corporate foundation. There can be company organized volunteer activities. Companies can adopt socially responsible business practices such as producing ethical products. There can also be company funded advocacy campaigns. Isko 30 degrees kar dete hain. Are nahi yaar 45 degrees sahi hai. We Indians disagree on everything, but we agree. SBI is the banker to every Indian. SBI ka video KYC savings account. Finally I agree. SBI is the banker to every Indian. Meanwhile some factions in India Inc believe that mandating CSR is like levying an additional tax they suggest that it should be voluntary rather than mandatory that's all for today we will be back with more news and analysis on our next episode if you like this video share it and subscribe to business standard For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.